Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. A good Monday to you on this July 11th. A shout out to Brenda Wamsley this morning, who is the very first in the Real Talk live chat. Oh, yeah. Every on day. this Monday, wishing everybody a good morning. Uh, she says it's 7 Eleven, it's free Slurpee Day, which Ooh. would not have been on my radar. I'm going to have to tr- try to keep that off the radar of the little guy in our house, Wyatt, who is just recently. <laughs> Sweet too. Oh, he's just recently discovered Slurpees and he's, he's realizing how absolutely incredible they are and this is not an advertisement for 7-eleven although i guess in a way it kind of is a free one but uh (laughs) he just hits that slurpee station hard he's had he's had three in his entire life i realized the other day we went for one to celebrate it not the other day it was his last day of school we went for one to celebrate and i realized i have i've lost it like as an adult you know they say when you're for example you know if if you're a bit of a drinker your your hangovers get worse as you get older I realized I am I can't handle the brain freeze now from a Slurpee. Like I, I'll take down like oh I destroy my head with it every time. Oh, it's I can't handle it. It's like I'll a take down like thing. a half inch. I'll take down just like a tiny little yeah. bit out of the cup, and I'm just like, geez, I need two minutes for my brain to get back to normal. So I can't do it anymore. We went the, me and the wife and had our first like like a week ago, yeah. and I was like, this takes an hour to drink now. <laughs> it's true, <laughs> it's, and it's then it's a battle because it's melting. You got to stay up to the I- anyway. Okay, all right. Um, and, and then people asking on the on the live chat as well. Uh, people are talking about Calgary Stampede over the weekend. You know, let us know if you were down there. I saw a pretty significant contingent of of real talkers, people that I follow on social media, people I know that follow the show. Uh, people were down there taking it all in from the parade. Kevin Costner there on the parade <laughs> late last week, and then Dances of course with wolves. Yeah, and every while well, Yellowstone's the big one now yeah. for for old KC. Have you been? Have you checked out that show? I don't want to talk about it. Really? Because I did check it out, and I just you can't you don't like it. Am I out of the Am I out of the loop? Like I just don't get it. Why Why does everyone love it so much? I just I don't, know. I don't love it that much. And I'm like, why well, should love? Is there Isn't there things like people love, and you're like, I should love this. Why don't I? Well, and then you can't really figure out why you're not connecting with something it. Are you missing me? something? That's yeah. been me on a lot of things. Yeah. Me back in the day, that was me with Avatar. Mm-hmm. I couldn't figure out what everybody thought was so great about Avatar, and I still can't figure it out. I I think the premise of the show, I get it. Like people want to connect with it because it's a, you know that that, that that lifestyle and everything. I just don't think I don't know. It's just not engaging. It was like this. It's like the Sopranos in Montana. Yeah. That's basically what totally. it is, right? Although I didn't watch The Sopranos, so here, no, who knows? But I got I like star-studded cast, and you know, yeah, all that, so. yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Hey, but no we're, offense. Already, we're already off the script, and uh, but that's emails. okay. We're going to get emails and <laughs> angry emails from from big Johnny Yellowstone, like Yellowstone Yellowstone fans. Uh, how was your weekend? You have a good one. It was good. Yeah, I had the uh, Elks fan day yesterday. People, you know, uh, you know. Oh, you're on the field at uh, Commonwealth Stadium. Yeah, and obviously Edmonton Elks. Yeah, performance of the team not doing so good here in Edmonton, but fans still loyal. They love the team. They came out, uh, watched a live practice, and uh, got some autographs. Yeah, had some sports hot dogs. fans are in Edmonton they, they especially. Think, yeah, I mean, short term, there, there, there's kind of the two perspectives you have to have. Short term, you can get frustrated with your team. And then long term, you're like, we're talking, it's a relationship, right? It's like a family. It's that loyalty. And Edmonton fans know, like, let's just wait. Let's hold that. With, like with the Oilers. When I joined the Oilers, oh, geez. it was, ugh. And then two years later, Connor. And now look where we're at. So people are just like, they're like. But you can't say look where we're day. at. Because if you say, look, you only say look where we're at if you're hoisting the, if, they're, if all the players are like in hot tubs with the Stanley Cup right now. Hey, closest we've been <laughs> in many years. All right. It's an improvement. Uh, free agency kicks off in the next couple of days, right? Yeah. NHL free agency. Some and I know that uh, our buddy Andrew Walker will be uh, working on that, covering that with the hedge at thehedgepod.com. Walks joined us on Friday. That was fun. We had a fun kind of a lazy Friday show. Yeah. And in lieu of our Friday roundtable, which, which uh, there was a key. We don't need to explain everything, but but I will say there was a. We, we have a Friday roundtable we're working on, but there was one key voice for the one on Friday. We had two pieces, but the third couldn't make it at, at, right at the last minute. I said we can't we can't do it without that voice, and so it's it's okay. I'm going to keep you keep the suspense high, uh, keep you locked and loaded <laughs> on what that one's going to be all about. But of course, we always want to make sure the conversations we have here have the voices that need to be included, and so that one will be there to come. But Walker talking about the NHL first round, the first round of the draft and all that kind of fun stuff. I didn't yeah. ask him how he shot in the Lacombe 
men's open. He was play, he, he kind of left. He had to leave he right was, after he, he talked was, to us. He, he was went, off the grid this weekend because you yeah. know Rogers the phone thing going Jeez. on. So I couldn't contact him, and he did like a he did like a three day. Uh, golf tournament so yeah I, I didn't even talk to him till last night at like eight i don't know i don't think uh charles adler's on rogers i don't think so we're gonna talk to him in just a Maybe second he we'll is because he's not here yet <laughs> so yeah. Might actually be it. <laughs> it it's on. fixed now, right? Isn't it? I would yeah. imagine people would still be, although it's kind of hard because you don't really hear from people that were on Roger. It was a frustrating I few did. days for I, people. I heard from a friend on Saturday who said his banking and everything was up again. So It impacted so much, this this Rogers outage. We're learning a little bit more about it, uh, about what happened. And it was like this update that they were trying to do. And it impacted all these servers. But it's kind of interesting when something like this happens, you realize how beholden people are uh, to, to technology. And I know that I'm stating mm-hmm. the obvious here, but it wasn't just that people couldn't check their TikTok or people couldn't post on Instagram. That wasn't just it. It was that people weren't able to sort of carry out everyday activities. People weren't able to do their online banking. Stores had their points of sale absolutely handcuffed. So it was impacting that. commerce over the weekend. You wonder how many millions or like, can I say hundreds of, I don't know, at least let's say how many millions of dollars were were sort of interrupted when it came to transactions for for people that were I think of even things like farmers markets and the small mom and pa shops that, mm-hmm. that heading into the weekend. I mean, this is huge for them. Obviously, people couldn't call 911, as you mentioned, in Toronto and Fredericton and Winnipeg and even in Edmonton. Uh, police were advising. I don't know. I'm laughing, but pl- police were advising uh, folks if, if you needed to call 911 to use a landline. Like, who even has a landline? I mean, I'm sure some people have a landline, but I don't think most people even have one anymore. Um, transportation and transit w- was impacted. Canadian Border Services Agency had been saying that they weren't able to to carry out some of the duties that they needed to carry out. And then there were, you know, schools and libraries. They have these remote summer programs. People were interrupted on mm. those as well. I mean, it was just a huge deal. And so up to the minute today, what's happening uh, the innovation minister, uh, the federal industry minister, rather, is going to be meeting with the different telecom. You know, he'd be talking to the CEOs, essentially, after what they're describing is that unacceptable Rogers outage. We're always curious to know how that impacts you. And you can let us know whether it's in the live chat, whether you're using our hashtag Real Talk RJ, of course, sending us an email to talk at Ryan dot com. It's a great way for you to let us know exactly you know, what's going on in your world and how some of these so-called national news stories or international news stories are impacting you. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's one of those things where it, it you kind of realize that that had it been an even bigger deal, like let's say it wasn't just Rogers, mm. had it been, you know, people are talking about monopolies. People are talking about the fact that C- Canadians really don't have much choice when it comes to our phone and Internet providers, right? You're either pretty much rogers bell or telus right or some of their subsidiaries and spinoffs whether you're you know Kodo or fido or whatever they're called I'm, I'm i'm not really up to speed on all of them but but there's really not a lot of choice and then i saw some folks that couldn't help themselves and i don't blame them from other international jurisdictions it was mostly it seemed canadian expats that were living in other countries saying is now a good time to let you know that i get unlimited data streaming in <laughs> insert country you know Britain, Madagascar, New Zealand, wherever you were for like $18 a month Mm. is now a good time to mention that Canadians are going, you know, you might not even have that great of a plan and it's probably 110 bucks a month. Yeah. Right. So it was a, it was a certainly something that got people talking. Um, I'll have to ask Adler if he has a landline. We'll find out in the in the next little bit. Wanted to let you know, coming up a little bit later on in this show, it's going to be in about a half hour from now, let's say 25 minutes, half an hour from now. Um, I'm honored that uh, journalist and podcast host Connie Walker is going to join us. Her project, uh, it's a Gimlet Media exclusive on Spotify, Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's, easily uh, one of the most powerful bits of journalism that I have ever experienced. It uh, wrapped up. It's an eight-part series. I know that many of you have already checked it out because the feedback, as soon as we announced late last week that Connie was going to be talking to us, you started letting us know how moved you had been by that podcast. Uh, it, it, it starts with a personal journey of hers. We'll get into it with her when she joins us in about a half an hour, but she wanted to find something out. A very powerful story involving her father uh, and his time and then the impact 
longer term of his time at St. Michael's Indian Residential School in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. Her dad went on to become an RCMP officer. There was an intersection, a collision of worlds. His experience as a youth with these priests and nuns, and then his experience as an RCMP officer, and of course a lot of time in between. A young man growing into an adult, raising a family, uh, or at least having children. It's unbelievable what Connie discovered when she embarked on this journey, trying to find out who a specific priest was. I don't want to say too much right now, but if you know this story, you know that this conversation we're going to have with Connie is going to be one you will not want to miss. Plus, it's Monday, which means positive reflections presented by Kubi Energy. I had a personal experience yesterday, and as it was happening, I was thinking, I got to tell our real talkers about this. I got to tell our audience about this. And so we're going to get into that in positive reflections. Before we get into this conversation with Charles Adler, the Titan of Talk, the Emmy winner, you were telling me that your family, John, made a decision, you and your wife, over the weekend, uh, you've now taken your allegiances exclusively, <laughs> and feel free to bring up the music bed here, because I was hoping you wouldn't mind sharing a few photos. Over the weekend, you swung by Friesen Brothers, I and did. then what? And we've just, we've switched over. We've decided, you know, uh, they just got more options for us. You know, we're a plant-based house. Yeah. And uh, they've just got so many options. I know there's plant-based options at every uh, supermarket, but they just have an abundance of different things, uh, whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or whether you just want to keep some of that stuff around the house, because everyone's got a family member sure. now who, who's got someone, so... I just took some pictures of some of the stuff we grabbed. Here's my wife's hand. She's grabbing some. They've got all sorts of, like, normally you just see, like, you know, soy milk or whatever. They've got not milk. They've got next milk. They've got all these new ones that are made from, I don't know how they do it, out of pineapple and different things, but it doesn't taste like pineapple. At what it's, point do they have to stop using the word milk? I I think that's why they're We're getting close. really calling it next milk and not milk. Uh, they've got great, like, we grabbed some mac and cheese here. There, that's totally dairy-free, because a lot of people, it's not about being vegan. They're just, you know, lactose intolerant, Absolutely. stuff like that. Some nice cheddar slices to throw on the barbecue like there. Like non-dairy cheddar. Non-dairy cheddar. Pretty good cheddar. stuff. Yeah, and of course... Had to go hit up the pizza market there Atta on the way boy, out. And the Father nice. Dough Pizza. And I told you about this last week. These are actually really good. Don't laugh. These are very good steaks uh, from Butchers in Vancouver that I find uh, at Freeze and This Bros. is the plant-based steak. Yeah, so they're made from jackfruit and, I don't know, it's magic inside. But uh, you put a little barbecue sauce on that and throw it on the grill. Keep a couple of these around. Maybe you'll we'll have it, someone man. come over when you're having a barbecue this summer and... and you know, you've got an option for them. 100%. You're absolutely right. You can find Friesen Brothers in 16 Alberta communities for more than 65 years. They have been Alberta-grown, Alberta-owned. You can find out more online at Friesen.com. Also, a big shout-out to our friends at Infinity Healthcare. I saw one of the Infinity uh, vehicles I was telling you out and about just a few days ago. They got this little Fiat, and it's all branded. Uh, Infinity uh, branding, and I thought I was wondering... Are they visiting? Are they providing home care services to somebody literally on our street? It was that close, right there in the neighborhood. Uh, I know that Real Talkers have been connecting with this idea because you tell us. When we say those of you that are looking after your parents now, you want to make sure you have reliable, trustworthy, perfect fit home care. You're going, yeah, that's us, right? But everybody's family's different. And some of the sensitivities or some of the specific requirements will vary. Infinity works with you. It's not a cookie cutter approach. They know that doesn't work in home care. How do they know that? Because these are RNs uh, that worked in the public health care system for years and years before they started this service. You can learn more at infinity-8.ca. Well, every Monday, it's our honor and pleasure to connect with the RTDNA Lifetime Achievement Award-winning talk host, Charles Adler. A dog dad, says his mug this morning as he checks in from I don't know where. Which Canadian province are you joining us from this morning, Chuck? <laughs> I'm in British Columbia, and I, you know, people keep doing this. Is he a left winger? Is he a right winger? Whatever, you know, forget all of that boring, <laughs> tedious uh, ideological stuff. I am a dog dad. This is how I identify. I'm the dad of, of Odell and Austin, and that's what matters to me a whole bunch more than politics and ideology. Odell and Austin, same breeds, different breeds. Bring us, take yeah, us behind no, the same curtain. breed. They're they're both uh, Beaver, and it's spelled the B I E W E R. Beaver Terriers, and not just any Terriers, 
Ryan oh. Bevere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm 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 calling up for those that are. I mean, most will hear this on the podcast, and so they can do their own googling. Right. But for those that are sure. watching us on YouTube, I'm calling up a photo now. To be clear, these are not your dogs here that I'm showing on the screen. Uh, but I do believe, yeah, we have some Beaver Terriers here. These are, these are good looking yeah. pups. They're, yeah, they're just they're wee, just wee ones. Do yours have their hair up in the in the high ponytails as well? Or the, well, the uh, occasionally the little girl does. The little boy. Uh, you know, I'm kind of traditional. I won't do that to my. My little boy dog, my little girl dog has that. Yeah, and oh, we just call them uh, Odie and, and Osti, and they are the loves of my life. And uh, Odie weighs uh, just under um, under five pounds, and uh, Osti I think is now just under seven pounds. So yeah. they're they're tiny. They're gorgeous. I was uh, shocked over the weekend walking my boxer Moses uh, past a past a restaurant with a beautiful outdoor patio, and uh, we were walking past a table of folks that had a stroller out. The stroller was covered by one of those sort of mosquito nets. And as we were walking yeah. by, I figured that it was a baby until the stroller exploded in barking. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know the breed. <laughs> It may have been a Bovair <laughs> Terrier. I have no idea, but uh, but I thought it was pretty funny. They had their, they had their little guy there in the stroller as they were eating outside. A little bit of a different scenario than ours. Some people might have thought that 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 Charles Adler, uh, the longtime here, prophet, here, here it comes. yeah, here you know it comes. what I was that you would have a Rottweiler, I know, or that you'd yeah, have a I German be, Shepherd or something. I, yeah, I, I I used to be known as as the Radio Rottweiler, <laughs> and uh, over the years I've had uh, you know all kinds of uh, dogs. But um, I, I love these uh, little ones, and uh, they're not little to me because they've got uh, great big barks. But most important, they got great big hearts. Look, uh, putting everything aside about everything we ever talk about, whether it's human beings or dogs, friends, uh, you know, podcasts, whatever, when something in your life brings out the best in you, when something in your life makes you want to be generous, makes you want to give, makes you want to be the, the best of who you are, that's just wonderful, whether it's a creature, a podcast, a, a human being, whatever it is, a car, I don't care. But Odell and Austin, they bring the best out in me. Do you think that you can tell a lot about somebody or, or do you pull a lot of, do you extrapolate a lot of data uh, about somebody, at least in your own mind, based on their well, pet? I will, I will quote, uh, you know, the greatest person uh, has ever influenced me, and that would be my dad, of course, Mike Adler. And the late Mike Adler used to say that if a person doesn't love flowers or animals, that's really not a person I want to spend much time with. Mike's a wise guy. Not a wise guy. A wise, <laughs> a wise man. A wise he man. Just, he just, you know, that's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's whatever assessment uh, – uh, you know, he came up with, he had lots of time to, to think. He was he spent a lot of time in solitary. Hmm. Um, and uh, that that's, you know, and I, my dad would always say, you know, all of these things he would tell me are all generalizations. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, the human condition, uh, you, you have to generalize. There are always specifics. Uh, you know, uh, a moment ago, you were talking about uh, Friesen Brothers. And I'll, I'll just I'll just simply say, when I'm in Alberta, I'm a customer of Friesen Brothers, and I, I know I know that this kind of stuff offends a lot of people, especially in in Alberta, where very much in the um, in the livestock business. I mean, I, I get all of that. I'm not trying to disparage anyone. I know Ryan, your, your family has been in dairy for for many many years. Okay, yeah. so this isn't about putting anybody down at all. But I can tell you this: from the people who I met who are serious uh, vegans and vegetarians, but especially the vegans. You know, uh, I know a lot of people like to make fun of them. Uh, they care deeply about all sentient life, and that includes animal life. And so it's not about putting anybody down. They just come by it honestly. They, they feel if, if we can live our lives without having any negative impact uh, on animals, let's let's try that. If we can't go 100%, let's go 20%. Let's go 50%. Let's go. So God bless uh, John and, and his wife and, and all other people who are customers of Friesen Brothers and the Friesen brothers themselves. It's very easy in Alberta to be into, you know, cattle, dairy. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I get all that. Uh, well, and it's great. And, and it doesn't it have to be. It's called Cowtown, you know, even yeah. when I lived in Calgary. People go, so I, I get all of that. But I, 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 I do want to give five stars to people who 
try their best not to do anything in their lives to hurt animals. Well, and you and John, that's really what it's about for, you know, that's my wife's main thing. I mean, me, I kind of followed her into this, but that's her main thing. And I mean, it's not about being perfect. It's not about like not stepping on ants. And it's definitely not about being against. I've heard your wife just crushes ants. (laughs) If there's anything anybody knows about her. But like merciless. It's, it's like, and I it's, and to be and to be brutally honest, I've never been kind to cockroaches, <laughs> you know, human or animal. I mean, yeah. I never have been kind she, to a cockroach. She hates spiders, I'm sorry. but it's like Charles said. It's just about doing your best, twenty percent, ten percent, whatever it is, causing a little less harm. It it makes her feel good, and you know, I feel good when she feels. Good. Well, and and also, I think and Charles is kind of funny, right? Like you say, you know, vegans, vegetarians, people like to make fun of them, and uh, and I don't know if I don't know if that's still the case, really. I mean, there was always that joke of like, how do you know if someone one's vegan well don't worry they'll tell you right but 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 that joke has been used for a whole bunch of people right like like you know how do you know that someone's an mba don't worry they'll tell you how do you know that someone's a lawyer don't worry they'll tell you like they're, they're, like they you know the, the, the that joke has been recycled and used forever but but i guarantee i mean the it's not there's not a camp you don't have to pick a lane i don't think on that anymore a lot of people have no. have been have been either dialing back the amount of meat in their diet or mm-hmm. trying new different things or opening their minds to different approaches i think that's positive that to me is just people are learning more about the world around them people are mm-hmm. learning more about their personal health and what makes them feel good and what they put in their bodies and how is that a bad thing and also kind of like how is that anybody else's business and why do we got to fight why, is why it do we got to fight about vegans it vegans against farmers we were driving out to uh camrose me and my wife uh to just do we went out and met a friend this weekend and like she's just looking at all the cattle and yeah. sheep as we're driving by and she knows like if there were no farmers using those animals like she wouldn't see them she wouldn't experience that so it's like i don't know we, we it's different things but we just try to do the best we can yeah? charles another thing that i think has been worth considering in past is you get you get agriculture ministers and i understand i mean we all understand why they do this but they'll be at the big dairy farm like the ones that my cousins run or they'll be at the big ranch uh but you don't see them oftentimes like at the pulse farm like you know that what, what about the farmers that are ra- raising like beans and peas and and chickpeas and like fueling like i mean there's huge what about the farmers that are growing like the the, the, the global canola market is bonkers you could do an entire documentary on that these are also people that are contributing to the industry they're employing thousands of people responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue every single year right we feed the world, Ryan. I'm not trying to, you know, get all chauvinistic about Canada, but, you know, talk, talk to our friends in, in Saskatchewan and, you know, find out from them what percentage of soybeans on this planet, uh, you know, are grown right here in Canada, mostly in, in Saskatchewan. And I could say the same thing about Manitoba and Alberta. We grow the world's food. We feed the world. We're not braggarts. That's not who we are. But every now and then, if we if we are talking about this kind of topic specifically, we ought to be damn proud of agriculture and what our people who work in agriculture are doing, not just for Canadians, but for the entire planet. Yeah, well said. Uh, Jillian in the live chat, just giving us a bit of a heads up, though, uh, a warning, I guess, in a way. She says uh, she suffers from low iron. Uh, she says, so I'd eat people if I had to. Uh, survival of the fittest. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. You that know, from there's Jillian. There's iron and other stuff. <laughs> like, not you know, you can get pills in the pharmacy, Jillian. Uh, you know, but, God, but it, God bless. God bless the cannibals who are <laughs> subscribing to Real Talk. Let's not judge a group of yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I I see a window for a segue based on the movie Alive to talk about air travel, but it, it might be maybe I need a buffer in, in between. In the meantime, we were a little nervous, Chuck. We weren't going to be able to talk to you today because I admitted to John, although I consider you as in my inner circle of friends, a dear friend. I don't know who your cell phone. Are you a Rogers customer? I don't. I don't know who your. What was your last few days like? <laughs> you know. I should have brought a, a, a you know, a, a paper bag for this conversation and just worn a bag over my head instead of my silly cap. Uh, but yes, I am a, I am a Rogers customer. Ooh. I must admit, last night uh, I was so uh, inflamed. I guess. Uh, uh, by the way, can, can I use uh, this that, synonym, uh, that uh, syllable? 
flame when when I'm talking to people in Edmonton. I oh, hope so. You're talking anyway. to people across the country. You can say whatever. Well, you I know, want. I know, I know, but I, I know, but but I, I you know, the home home base is still uh, yeah, yeah. still oh, yeah, Edmonton yeah. for for Ryan Jesperson and John and no, his people anyway. Are, uh, people are fine with it, Chuck, because the Oilers made okay. quick work of the Flames in the in the Western <laughs> Conference semifinals. They, and nobody cares. They certainly did, and yeah. I must admit, I, I I shed more than more than a tear yeah. uh, when um, the the uh, the Oilers didn't get to the next round. But yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, as far as the uh, Rogers is concerned, I was so inflamed over the weekend. Uh, I took one of the Rogers tweets, which was just really thin, thin, not well assembled uh, public relations. It was it was bad, and I just uh, I just uh, tweeted uh, Rogers thinks they're in the communications business, but nobody else does. <laughs> Yeah. So the federal industry minister is going to be meeting with the telecom giants, including Rogers CEO, after what they called an unacceptable outage. But all joking aside, uh, it was not funny at all for Rogers customers. It was really I was talking about the interruption to commerce. Uh, it was not funny at all for the business owners that were unable to ring through points of sale, most especially through the Interact or, or debit setup. But what do you take away from this? I mean, some people are saying this is uh, a reason to look at monopolies or why you know why you got to break up big companies. I thought well, I don't really know if that's realistic. I don't know if that's something that it's the federal government's job to do. But it does get us thinking, doesn't it? Well, the federal, you know, the, the government's job is to be an umpire. I always uh, think of the hockey naturally, and I think the book referees and players and i don't care how good the players are if the, if the players uh, were just uh, playing uh, with no rules at all we'd have no players left uh, not even the goons because everybody would end up in the hospital so we need the referees we may not like the referees we need them we may not like government you know conceptually but we need a government we need somebody to make rules and enforce rules and uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the uh, government making rules about this because, let's face it, the government makes the rules that uh, have uh, prevented uh, people from the states and around the world from competing with our telecommunications companies. That's the real reason we only have a few. You know, it, 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 you know it, it's, it's basically Rogers, uh, Bell, and uh, you've got the company in Quebec owned by, by Pelado, but, you know, you've got uh, Rogers, Rogers, Bell and Telus. Yeah. And the reason you've got basically Rogers, Bell and Telus uh, and, and Shaw for, for the most part in, in this country is because this country's government, in this case, the federal government, has prevented the Verizons and all the other companies we know about because we all watch US TV. The reason they're not here is because the government doesn't allow them to be here. So to say that the government doesn't get involved is ridiculous. And I, I don't see the point of having fewer companies. I would like to have more companies. And if someone wants to tell me that this position is a socialist or communist, and he's a, once again, he's being a chai com, forget about all that bunk. I am a capitalist, and that means free enterprise. And yes, I'm generally much more pro small business than big business, not just because small business is where Ryan and I and John come from. It's simply because small business creates most of the jobs. Small business takes most of the risks. Yeah. Uh, huge corporations take advantage of small businesses all the time. And huge corporations want as much monopoly power as possible. That affects small business. And it affected small business on Friday, affected uh, the lives of many of the people in my life who own and operate small businesses who are madder, madder than hatter. Matter than a hatter about uh, about Rogers, and when Rogers says, "Well, you know, they'll compensate for you know they'll compensate people for just under four dollars." I mean, what a bloody insult that is! And no, I, I don't think government should allow the um, the monopoly. I don't think they should allow the takeover. I think that government should open the door wide to more competition. More competition will give us better prices, much better prices. The prices we pay in Canada. Absolutely ridiculous. Compare them with any anybody in the world. I don't care whether you're talking about the so-called developing world or developed world. Canadians are paying through the nose, and that is because government's mistake of not allowing competition. So government has to do a U-turn on that, allow for more competition, better prices, and yes, more reliable service. Why? Because when you're competing, you wouldn't dare have a situation like we had on what I'll call Black Friday. Yeah, very well said. Hey, we talked to you 
from uh, oftentimes, I mean, for the most part, you, you're back and forth between BC and Manitoba. I'm assuming you're not driving every week, uh, w- <laughs> which would lead me to believe that you're flying. And it's, see, I've, yeah. I've, I've, you know, I'm hearing from people, uh, and this is just anecdotal, but but obviously, uh, well, not anecdotally. I mean, you look around; there's been hundreds of flights canceled over the yeah. past while. It sounds like flying's yeah. been an absolute nightmare for people. How about for you? Yeah. Uh, flying for me, uh, and you know, I've done uh, both uh, Air Canada and WestJet, and I, I've got to tell you that I've had uh, no trouble at uh, Winnipeg and uh, Vancouver airports. They've been marvelous. However, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that if I was uh, having this conversation with you from Toronto, yeah. uh, where Pearson is a bloodbath uh, day after day after day, it's just it's just brutally inefficient. They don't have uh, nearly enough staff, and they've got far too much uh, traffic, far too many planes uh, for all the stuff about how horrible uh, the economy is or it's going into decline or whatever. You wouldn't know it at uh, Pearson. You wouldn't know it in a lot of situations where there is an abundance of growth and opportunity. Air travel is incredibly important, obviously. Yes, I, I have to sometimes discuss what's obvious and uh, the, the various levels of uh, government, which once again are the umpires, the reps, the, the regulators. They've got to get uh, very, very busy about making sure that important infrastructure called airports have better staffing. It's all about the staffing. And uh, we need less excuses and more hiring, more opportunity. That whole staffing thing, I mean, it's one thing if you're talking about, you know, Air Canada and WestJet and Pearson. I mean, one of the busiest, I'm sure it's got to be one of the busiest airports in the world. It's certainly, obviously, by a mile, the busiest in Canada. I was walking past an independent restaurant, a very popular restaurant near our house just yesterday. It's like, I don't know, 28, 29. It's just absolutely beautiful. This restaurant's got that kind of, you know, those kind of glass garage doors that open at the front of the restaurant. Yeah. And they've yeah. got all their picnic tables out. The The reason we stopped, I don't usually stop when I walk past. Otherwise, the smell of their fried chicken and their Dorito smashed <laughs> mac and cheese draws me in, right? Their fresh tossed coleslaw, their cornbread yeah. drizzled with maple syrup, Charles. But they had a dog dish out. They had a water dish out. So Moses wanted to hit that up. Obviously, it's nice. So we stop, and and all of a sudden, I see one of their staffers. She comes out, and she's clearing off the t- tables. But, like, not clearing off the dishes. She's taking off the napkins. She's taking off all the signage. I said, I go, what's going on? It's like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She goes, we're shutting down. It's a Sunday in July. It's almost 30 degrees. Their patio should be banging. They've got craft beer on tap. They're ready to rock. I go, you're shutting down. She goes, Short staff. She goes, we can't handle the amount of business that's coming at us today. So they yeah. were shutting down. I mean, I just yeah. if you're an owner of that place, can you imagine having to make that decision? I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Well, I'd, uh, you know, walking around uh, Vancouver the last uh, few days, and uh, love, I love the mom and pops. Uh, I just love mom and pops anywhere because once again, that's those are my roots. And it just breaks my heart. You know, a bunch of them are are obviously uh, shut down for several hours. Because of short staffs, they've got signs up. You know, please, uh, you know, you know, you know, please, please come in for for a gig. Yeah. Not please come in for a pizza or a cup of coffee. Please come in for for, for a job. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a very very bizarre situation. And the other thing that sort of frosts me is this uh, this comment that the only reason uh, that there's a, a job situation, the only reason is a staffing situation. Is because those uh, those those mom and pops are are misers and they're not paying enough. I, it, it breaks my heart when when I hear that kind of stuff. I, I know what it's like uh, to run a family business. I know how we treat uh, the employees. I'm not saying that there aren't some egregious examples, but most of the examples that I'm aware of, and I'm aware of thousands of them, we treat the employees uh, like family. And uh, I would just encourage anyone who is uh, looking for employment. Uh, with, with people who will very likely treat you better than any of the the, the, the big corporations, which only frankly uh, see you as a liability and not nearly enough as an asset. Uh, if you want to be treated well, uh, find a find a family business uh, and 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 just see see what that kind of life is like. A lot of people have never worked for a for a family business, and I'm not saying there are once again, I'm not saying there aren't some negative examples, but I bet you, Ryan, if, if you go into a conversation one day with just simply members of your own family who have run uh, small businesses, uh, they could go on and on about all of the people that they've worked with who were, yes, technically their employees, but really family. 
Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, entrepreneurs pay themselves last. That's what everybody always talks about. Maybe, I don't know if it's ironic or not. You can ask Alanis Morissette, but <clears throat> the, the, this business in particular that had to shut down. That was the irony about that song by Alanis Morissette is that half of the things she's talking about that are ironic are not ironic. They're not. That's what's no. ironic, isn't it? No. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we're having this conversation 25 years too late. But this business I'm talking about that had to close its doors uh, for the day, I know for a fact, in, in my estimation, I'm saying this facetiously, but they actually pay their employees a little bit too much. Because because I know oh. I, I don't really mean oh, it, Chuck. Oh. But what I mean is that they I know the owners personally, and they no. pay their employees so well, benefits and everything else, because they care no. about them so much that the owners are scraping by. And I always say to them, "Hey, fellas, like you know, look after yourselves, right? Or there's not going to be any business to employ the people." And of no. course, we're chuckling as we say it, but their hearts are in it big time, and it just it, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, it was really disappointing to see, and I and I guarantee you that there's businesses across the country right now. Part of it maybe sort of follow from COVID. I don't know. But businesses across the country right now that are dealing with this. Well, they are. And, uh, you know, uh, I could I could go into members of my family, other families. I know it, it, very, very often. Uh, I'm not saying their employees, quote, did better than them. You know, that's just not, not fair. But mm. uh, they all of them, all of the ones that I personally knew, paid their employees better than anyone else would because they wanted to hang on to them. And their core principle was uh, that um, if, if our employees want to stay with us, so will our customers. Uh, loyalty was everything. And uh, they couldn't prove this on a graph. Uh, they couldn't prove this at a, at a Harvard business course. And they don't certainly don't teach this at Harvard Business School or any of our great business schools across the country. Uh, but there's an energy there. When you're a customer, you know, a service business where you're meeting the employees, you can tell whether the employee is uh, treated well. And it does impact on you. It does impact on your desire to stay loyal. It also impacts on your, your desire to tip the employee. You know, I, I, just, I just can't say enough about uh, small businesses that take huge risks. And yes, I guess one of them is with operations that includes employees. But um, to, to be kind to your employee, to be generous with your employee is the best possible way of building loyalty with your customer base, in my humble, always humble opinion. Always. Right. The, the, the most humble man in Canada. Just ask him. Uh, try, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> hey, but real quick, I know we're over time, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to Connie Walker in just a second. Chuck, I know you got to go as well, but uh, it, was, it was the day after we last spoke. Charles Adler joins us every Monday here on Real Talk. Uh, the the uh, Conservative Party of Canada disqualifies Brampton's mayor, uh, disqualifies Patrick Brown as a candidate uh, in this leadership race. And I thought, oh, man, of course, I got to wait six days to ask Chuck about this. Just just real quick. It was a whistleblower. Debbie Jodoin that was working on the campaign says she was being yeah. paid surreptitiously. Your thoughts on this and, and what it does to the leadership race in general? Well, first of all, uh, anybody in, in politics or journalism that is surprised that uh, some people involved in, in politics are being paid by a third party, in many cases, a company which technically employs the person and then uh, volunteers their efforts to the party. This goes on with all political parties. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think about, uh, you know, some of my friends, uh, you know, at, at, at the NDP parties and uh, provincially and, and federally, I mean, if it wasn't for unions uh, volunteering uh, help for them, uh, how much help would they receive i'm not saying that others aren't coming from other places but this is this is really common in canada i don't believe that uh, that uh, patrick brown was taken out because uh, they discovered oh my god uh, gambling in the casino that some company <laughs> was uh, paying the play i don't know what the what the reason was but i i just know that uh, this is the kind of thing that really stinks up politics and i don't want to crash the the whistleblower who is a civilian uh, but there, you know, there, there's lots of evidence that uh, people say they have, including uh, social media, that would suggest that uh, this particular um, whistleblower uh, was also or is also a follower of, uh, of Polyev. I don't think Polyev needed this to happen to win because I've been telling you for the longest time that it's in the bag. But um, I'll tell you, if I were running the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, I would go out of my way not to throw out one of the only people in the race, it, it, there are only two people who really give Polly have any kind of uh, competition at all, that's uh, Charest and Brown. So I think for the Conservative Party of Canada to toss Brown, you know, 
unless he committed some sort of egregious crime and the crime, I'm not talking about the, the crime of having some company uh, paying a, an employee, but unless he committed some kind of really, really sick criminal code offense, I think tossing him was stupid. A party that was always thought to be rational, reasonable, intelligent, does so many stupid things. If the Conservative Party didn't behave stupidly, they'd be running the country right now. I'm dead serious. You know, for all these people who want to think that I'm kissing up and sucking up to Trudeau, what nonsense. I love competition. We just talked about competition in small business. I like political competition. It's good for democracy. I want the Conservative Party to be stronger, but they're never going to be stronger if they insist on playing stupid. That's Charles Adler, the titan of talk. Catch him every Monday right here on Real Talk. Be well this week, my man. Thanks for doing this. You bet. Connie Walker up in just a moment. I'm so looking forward to talking to her about her podcast, Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. These conversations happen because we have the support of amazing partners like the team at Park Power. And they're looking out for you right now, especially if you're living in the province of Alberta. You've been hearing about these electricity rebates. And by the way, Real Talkers, we've been hearing what you have to say about this. This electricity rebate program, how a lot of people are, are, are sort of being sidestepped on this that that people who you you may be able to argue need the rebates the most are not qualifying for these rebates a a whole other matter and we'll get to that on the show but in this case park power wants you to know that they've become aware of several phishing scams relating to this electricity rebate program they have a blog post on it so you can protect yourself go to parkpower.ca to check that out and when you bring your electricity natural gas and internet business to park power make sure you use the promo code 2022-REALTALK when you sign up it gets you $70 off your first bill from Park Power our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge want to remind you that they've got the best selection of Ram trucks, Dodge and Jeep vehicles in the province of Alberta, why? Because their ownership group has both these dealerships, it means they can check both inventories and find you the perfect ride so whether you're upsizing to pull a trailer pull a boat whether you're downsizing based on the price of fuel right now uh, uh, the teams at sherwood and st albert dodge are going to find you exactly what you're looking for they can do it online you can shop right there from the safety the security the comfort of your own home or you can go see them in person you can find them under the sponsors tab on our website ryanjesperson.com And don't forget, it's never too late to check in with the team at Eden Landscaping. Uh, Yeah, mid-July, they can get started on something. Maybe have you ready for your annual Labor Day gathering. It could be an upgrade to your fire pit. Maybe you need some work on that retaining wall that's just about to come down. Uh, Maybe you've thought about putting in an underground sprinkler system, an outdoor kitchen, a water feature. Over their 20 years of bringing outdoor spaces to life, they've seen and done it all, earning the return business and the referrals from their satisfied customers you can reach mike and his team today at eden landscaping by visiting landscapeedmonton.ca i hate you residential school i hate you you're a monster a huge hungry monster built with steel bones built with cement flesh you're a monster built to devour innocent native children You're a cold-hearted monster, cold as the cement floors. You have no love, no gentle atmosphere. Your ugly face grooved with red bricks. Your monster eyes glare from grimy windows. Monster eyes so evil. Monster eyes watch and terrified children cower with shame. I hate you, residential school. I hate you. That's the voice of Dennis Saddleman. He's a survivor of the Kamloops Indian Residential School, and his voice featured on the Gimlet Media Spotify podcast, Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. Now, it's an investigation into the St. Michael's Indian Residential School in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan, which operated for more than 100 years. Connie Walker's dad went there, so did her uncle's. Her aunts, as a matter of fact, her grandparents attended that school as well. And when she heard a story from her brother about her dad's experience in his professional life as an RCMP member, years after attending that school, she embarked on a journalistic journey that I suspect 
she had no idea would impact her and her growing audience to the degree that it did, myself included. What an honor to welcome journalist Connie Walker to Real Talk. Thank you for making time for us this morning. It's so good to see your face. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. No, I've, your your eight part series uh, released week by week, and I, I was one of those that as soon as an episode would be released, I, I would jump right back into it. But I, I would I would prepare myself uh, before I did because of the power of these stories for members of our audience that may not be familiar uh, with your journey and with Stolen. Can you tee this up for us, Connie, how this came about, how it all got started based on a social media post from your brother? Yeah, I was just scrolling through um, on my phone on social media one day and I read a post that was made by my brother, Hal Cameron. And it was a story about our dad, our late father, Howard Cameron, that I had never heard before. Um, and Hal wrote that when my dad was in the RCMP, he was a special constable in the RCMP in the late 1970s, stationed somewhere in rural Saskatchewan. Um, he saw a vehicle on the side of the road swerving, and he thought that the driver may be impaired, and so he pulled over this vehicle. And when he got to the driver's side window, he realized that he recognized the driver as a priest who had abused him at residential school. And my dad beat up the priest on the side of the road that night. And he how, he told Hal that he expected to get in trouble, expected for there to be a complaint, but nothing ever happened. And it just became a story that he then shared with my brother years and years later. And then my brother shared um, last May after the news from Kamloops broke. And when I read that post, I mean, I, I, I instantly felt ill because I didn't know that my dad had been abused at residential school. I didn't, and it made me realize I didn't know anything about his residential school experience. I didn't know where he went or for how long. And, and I felt like, you know, I, I've been a journalist for 20 years and that that was something I should know. I should be connecting those dots in my own family. And, and that was the beginning of our podcast. So you start traveling, uh, you start hitting the road and, and meeting with, uh, you know, your aunties and your uncles and people uh, that also survived. You know, I would say attended. They survived uh, that residential school in, in search of information about who this priest was. You know, what was his name? What was his identity? What, what was the initial connection to your dad? You want to learn more about your dad's experience uh, as a young boy at this school. I, I, I believe that he was sent there when he was six years old. Uh, six years old. But the more people that you talk to, and, and I'm trying to find the balance here, Connie, just to say that I, I, I really want to make sure that people listen to your podcast. So I don't want to talk too much about the specifics uh, because the, it's a journey as an audience member. It's a journey as a listener. But the more people that you talk to, the more you learn about the magnitude of how this specific school uh, in Duck Lake impacted not just your family members of that generation, but for generations to come. Yeah. And I just have to say, I'm so excited to talk to you about it as well, because this is something that I have been like living and breathing and just, you know, sitting with for months and months and months now. And especially now that the podcast is over and we're not working on episodes, although actually we may be working on a bonus episode, but, you mm -hmm. know, it feels like the infrastructure to talk about it goes away, but my interest doesn't. I'm still so deeply invested. I feel like obviously this is such a personal story. Um, and, and I'm just so grateful to, to have it out in the world now and to actually be able to share it with people and then to talk to people like you who, who like made the time to listen, like, I'm just so grateful that, that people are listening and, and hearing this story. But, you know, I think that as a journalist, it was like this strange journey for me to kind of embark on, obviously, because it, it is so personal. Yeah. It is such a personal story. It's my dad's story. Like, you know, what happened to him at six years old, you know, that that stayed with him for that long. And and I, as I began to uncover more about him through these interviews with my dad's brothers and sisters who also went to the school, I began to see like just how connected I was to this story as well. Like just how connected, um, you know, how our relationship was was shaped by his experience in that residential school, because like so many survivors, he really struggled for a long time. You know, you go through um, this kind of experience at six years old. He was a native Cree speaker when he was dropped off at St. Michael's. And, and and what I heard from family members and survivors there is like, it's, it's just this nightmare situation that children were put in where, you know, my family members immediately started talking about, you know, 
the hunger that they experience in the school, the loneliness, the fear, um, the, the punishment, the physical abuse by priests and nuns who ran the school. The school was run by um, a Catholic order of oblate priests called, or priests called the Oblates of Mary Immaculate and nuns um, from, a, from a local uh, organization as well. And, but then, you know, I immediately started also hearing names of, of priests um, who were allegedly abusive to children at the school. And in one of my very first interviews, my my dad's brother, my uncle Bill and his wife, my auntie Lorraine, told me that, you know, it wasn't just my dad who was abused at residential school, that one of my other uncles was also abused. Um, and they named a priest that then became kind of a focus of our investigation. And I, I, I'm like you, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah. I also feel like it's important to know that like, um, that we find out that he's still alive and that, that that becomes a part of the journey as well as like really trying to like, not only understand what they all went through as children at the school, but then also, you know, understand what happened to the alleged abusers after they left these schools. Your conversation, your interview with one of these alleged abusers uh, now in the in, in the dark winter of his life, if life is in seasons, uh, I, I think uh, it's safe to say that his is near the end. Um, and, and there's important conversation in the podcast as well about prosecuting these crimes. And I think that that's a conversation that needs to happen. You know, there, there's a point that's made in the podcast where we say if we're still going after war criminals, you know, people that were running gas chambers and operating Nazi concentration camps in World War II, there's absolutely no reason why we can't go after alleged abusers that were propping up and, and for a matter, as a matter of fact, uh, administrating Canada's residential school system for decades. Your conversation with one of those alleged abusers is one of the most powerful interviews I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, but it was, but you spoke to, I think it was, it was it 28, almost 30 survivors, uh, you yeah. and your team of journalists and producers. And one of them uh, was a man by the name of Eugene Arcand uh, who warned you, he said, don't, play with this right yeah. uh what did he say yeah. right, hang on a second i wanted to pick this yeah. up off the floor because I, I scribbled look at this it's a it's it's a magazine i had and i'm it, this has nothing to do with you but i'm look at this there's there's chicken scratch all over the cover because it's what I, i've been listening i'm Love scribbling it. down notes as i was listening to your your conversation with eugene and i've been carrying it he said don't become an expert on the backs of our misery and when he said that i just went Whew. yeah yeah, so how, was, did, how did you know? Because you were wrestling what you said, whether or not it like how much of my dad's story is mine to tell you wondered aloud. Yeah, I mean, that conversation with Eugene, uh, it, it, it really shook me. It really it really gave me pause. It really made me think about how I was approaching this story. You know, like I, I, I feel like. Um, I've, I've been a journalist now for over 20 years and always interested in telling these stories, but for a long time, there was very little interest in hearing stories from our communities. And, and as I've been given more and more opportunities to take them on, I've been thinking a lot about what is the approach? Like, how do you tell stories from your own community? How do you deal with the, the trauma that inevitably you encounter because so many Indigenous people have experienced with trauma? And, and especially with residential school survivors, I think what Eugene was saying was like, you know, they have been ignored and misunderstood and really gaslit for so much of their lives. You know, they left these schools um, as, as teenagers and then for years and years and years, decades, you know, um, what they endured in those schools was hidden, was not talked about, was they were not believed. And what Eugene was saying was that, you know, survivors need to be empowered to tell their own stories that, that, you know, that, that this, you know, he was so generous, I think as well, just in terms of like understanding and helping me understand how as intergenerational survivors, I've also been impacted. But I think what he told us about, you know, that, that they can do this, they can tell these stories. It really shaped the way that we, um, you know, the podcast laid out in the very next episode, we decided to, essentially hand the microphone over to survivors. We spoke to 28 survivors from St. Michael's and we wanted it to be, you know, to have them feel like they were empowered to tell their stories themselves. And it's a non-narrated episode. It's, you know, it's them essentially um, reconstructing the school through their memories and their voices and telling the truth about what they endured there as children. And that, that directly came from that conversation with Eugene. Um, and, and I think, you know, as a journalist, 
I think you're always thinking about, you know, how to be trauma informed and how to to approach story mm. sensitively, especially ones like these. But that was such a lesson that I feel like is just so applicable in my life as well as my work. There's there's things that you'll hear uh, as an audience member listening to something uh, like Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's, this this journey this journalistic journey, I keep referring because that's what it felt like. It felt like it was like you were learning about your family and you we were privileged enough. And, and I felt like it was an honor and, and almost there's a responsibility as an audience member, too. What are you going to do with this information? You know, as an indigenous person may have it will have a different response as a as a as a privileged middle class white person that will have a different response, perhaps than an immigrant to Canada that maybe wasn't aware of the residential school legacy, et cetera, et cetera. But you're talking about things like nutritional experiments being carried out on children, homemade electric chairs being used for discipline. I'm sitting there thinking like I can't even imagine when we, when you use the word survivor to describe us on audience member here when I was introducing you. They said, imagine that having to survive school. Uh, it, 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 it opens up, I suppose, the onus is on us uh, as people living in Canada right now. To, to, it demands uh, that we understand what these survivors have been living with, the challenges they encountered, the intergenerational aspect of this. And then to state the obvious, Connie, you know what I'm sitting there thinking as you're telling these stories? This is only one of the schools. This is only one. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I feel it's shameful that in 2022, um, we're just learning this history about St. Michael's. Like you said, it was open for a hundred years. Survivors um, have already told a lot of these stories, you know, as part of the residential school settlement that happened in the early 2000s. And, and, and as part of that, that settlement in order to receive compensation for the abuse they experienced, experience they had to talk about it through these government hearings they had adjudicators and if they were believed they were compensated but as part of that you know what they also did was they named their abusers and and the government hired private investigators to track down these alleged abusers um but not to investigate them criminally or to to you know try to hold them accountable but to invite them to participate in that process and so you know i as a journalist i i feel like I, I just feel so much regret that I didn't look at this sooner, that I didn't, you know, pay more attention earlier because what's happened is that the window for accountability, because, you know, what, what we uncovered at St. Michael's was just, you know, after that interview with the priest that you, you mentioned, the priest who we had heard multiple allegations against of sexual abuse in my dad's family, mm -hmm. you know, um, he denied abusing kids at the school, but he talked about abuse at the school in a way that, that, um, you know, I found disturbing, you know, he, he said that he actually saw other adults at the school, um, sexually abusing children. And it made me want to understand just how widespread was the abuse at this school? Like how many, like if there were three, three people in my dad's family, um, who experienced sexual abuse for people that I, that I, that I know of, um, how widespread was the abuse? And what we uncovered was just shocking and disturbing. And, and also infuriating because you know that the window for accountability is is small. You know, there are only a few of these alleged abusers who are still alive. And, and I think that the beginning, like the, the very first step we can all take is to understand the truth, to hear their stories, to give survivors your time and your attention and your space to finally um, be heard and, and understood. You're, talk you're talking to that former priest and uh, I, again, I won't spoil it, but but he says, you know, he's talking about, I, I suppose, his humanity or his fallibility or whatever. And he goes, yeah, well, sometimes I lie. And you say, are you lying to me right now? And I just stopped in my tracks. I was like, wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. People need to to check it out. You talk about being a trauma informed journalist, and that's important. Uh, in episode eight of eight, uh, which was just released a short time ago, uh, you get very personal and uh, I have to assume that this is unlike, I mean, you, as mentioned, you, your journalistic career has extended more than 20 years. You've worked on other high profile projects. Uh, this, unlike anything else you've ever done before, uh, once the reporting was finished and you start going into the editing booth and you start cutting it and putting it together and you've had time to think about it, 
and, and I'm sure it's visited you in your dreams and I'm sure it visits you in your waking hours as well. How, how would you describe the impact of this project on you personally, not but as a, as a person? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been the hardest thing I've ever worked on, like without a doubt, you know, I think, I think the, the hardest thing was really, you know, hearing, hearing the stories that my family shared with me, you know, because these are things that we never talked about. Like, you know, I, my, my dad is one of 15 kids, 15 of his brothers and sisters who went to that school. So all my aunts and uncles, they, they had a similar, if not, you know, the same experience as my dad, but we never talked about it. And so hearing the stories from them about what they endured as children, about the, the hunger, the fear, the loneliness, the, the abuse, um, was so difficult and, and holding and feeling the responsibility of hearing those stories and, and wanting to share them in a way that was respectful and trauma informed felt like such a huge weight. Uh, and I always feel that responsibility, but it, I think it's, it's just magnified by so much when it's your own family. And, and then it also became an exploration into my own childhood trauma. You know, I, I mentioned like in the first episode, actually, you know, how I witnessed violence at home from my dad, how he was physically abusive and, and starting to understand and connect the dots um, was such a, like, it was such a difficult thing. And, and then understanding other experiences that I had and how they were connected to the abuse that happened at St. Michael's, it, it was um, just heart-wrenching. And, and But also I have to say like, so healing to actually um, shine a light on something and to have a process to talk about it and to have the infrastructure to to go through it. And throughout making of the podcast, you know, I, I also, I, I'm seeing a therapist every week, a trauma uh, specialized, like a, a therapist that focuses on trauma. And I'm, and, and I have such an incredible support system um, through my family and through my partner and, and at work, it, it has felt like it has been, you know, it sounds kind of cliche or cheesy to say, but a really healing journey for me as well to to kind of expose this truth and to understand it and connect the dots. And, and as I've been like, I, I, I feel like I strive to be a, a trauma informed journalist. And I feel like, you know, that's not something that I learned about um, in school or on the job uh, until very recently. But one of the things that I've been learning about is, is that one of the ways that you can heal from, from trauma is to talk about it, mm -hmm. is to talk about it in, in an environment where you feel safe, where you're given agency, where you're given respect. Um, and, and that I feel like is something that I try to, an environment that I try to create for people that I'm interviewing and talking to, but also one that I, I feel like I had in, in, in going on this journey. So it has been difficult but it has also felt like such a gift in, in so many ways in, in each of your episodes uh there's uh, at the beginning a, a note uh, that, that there will be vivid or, or you know detailed descriptions of of uh, sex abuse physical abuse against children uh you you warn the audience uh you know essentially and then at the end um you provide some resources uh, for people that may be living with or perhaps have survived uh, that type of abuse. And then you invite people that may have information about specifically about St. Michael's in, in Duck Lake to contact you. Uh, I'm curious to know how many people did what you heard from other survivors. And I have to imagine you've heard from survivors of other residential schools across the country as well. How did this land with, or how did this impact as far as you can tell uh, survivors across the country? Yeah. You know, I, I think, um over like the overwhelming reaction has been a positive reaction and i feel like what you know it starts out as a very personal story about me and my dad um but i think that what i quickly realized and what i heard from so many people even after the first few episodes came out was how this was also their story you know that so many people had the same experience and i remember you know in 2015 i was um a reporter at, uh for cbc television and i was um, covering the final event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I remember Justice Sinclair, uh, who was the chief commissioner of the TRC, um, telling a room packed full of media and intergenerational survivors and survivors of residential school that there's not a single Indigenous person in Canada who's not been touched by the legacy of residential schools. And, and I knew that was true, but I had, hadn't connected the dots in my own family. And, and I feel like 
what I've learned and what I've seen is like how, you know, this is not just me and my dad's story. This is the story of almost every uh, Indigenous person and survivor and their family. Like we've all been impacted by this legacy in, in so many heartbreaking ways, but it's also just the time right now where we're starting to connect the dots and we're starting to unpack what's happened. And the response that I've heard from community and, and family has just been just so overwhelmingly positive and and just makes me feel so grateful uh, to the survivors for sharing. But also, you know, I, I feel like as a journalist, I'm I'm also hearing from, you know, from from people who um, who who knew or know some of the people who worked at St. Michael's, and you know, I, I I still feel like there's more reporting to be done. Like there's more, you know, we, there's still more work that we need to do. And and I think your point about how this is one residential school is is so important you know like of course st michael's deserves this attention of course st michael's like it was so important for me personally to do an investigation at one school and what we found was just staggering but it only makes me want to know more i want to know about every residential school i want to know how many alleged abusers um you know or were at these schools how many of them were ever prosecuted i know it's a very that number is really small but the window of accountability hasn't closed there is still opportunity there for for us to expose people and to expose the truth and for people to learn about what survivors went through i mean for perspective you know in your reporting you talk about uh, you know credible accusations and 45 people accused uh, just out of St. Michael's residential school alone, including, I think, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, 13 nuns, 17 priests, uh, yeah. as well as staff, 45 people credibly accused in one residential school. I mean, if if that's not a perspective check, I don't know what is. As a matter of fact, it's staggering, uh, to be honest with you, and I can't even really wrap my mind around it. Um, that, and that's that is, and that's also like that's sexual abuse. Like those those are forty five people who are accused of sexual abuse. And in in the work, like what we were able to uncover, there there were more than two hundred and twenty allegations of sexual abuse um, against those forty five individuals. And many of them were um, had multiple allegations against them. And some of them, you know, were not just one time occurrences. Some of them was like were instances of abuse that occurred over days, weeks, and even years. I'm sure you're aware, obviously you're aware that the Pope uh, will be visiting uh, Canada uh, to, to make an apology for the Catholic Church's role in these residential schools. Uh, one of the stories that people are covering in, in Alberta right now as, as the Pope will visit Masquachis a community uh, just south of Edmonton, as a matter of fact, about an hour and a half south of Edmonton, is that they're finally getting some roads paved down there, I guess, so the Pope doesn't have to have a bumpy road, metaphorically or literally, uh, through this apology. Where's your head at with regards to this papal apology? You know, I, I really feel like it's it's the space should be given to survivors to talk about what, what they want and need and, and, and would like at this point personally. Um, you know, I as a journalist, I find it really interesting, especially the places that he's visiting. Um, uh, the, the priest who I interviewed, who was accused, uh, the Oblates told us he was accused, credibly accused, 16 times by 16 children of sexual abuse against him. Um, I, I'm just, my mind is blown that the Pope is going to be um, retracing his steps in, in so many ways. He was, he ministered in Masquachis for many years. Um, this priest uh, who had these allegations against him, he also helped start the Native Pastoral Center where the priest, or where the Pope is going to be making um, a, a stop, and he also uh, was at Lac La Biche, where which is also where the Pope is going. And just I feel like that is just illustrative to me of of just the 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 reckoning that needs to happen within the Catholic Church around uh, you know these priests who have been by their own admission credibly accused like multiple times, like by 16 survivors of, of sexual abuse. And that was information that, that just, you know, that, that would never have been known if we hadn't, if we hadn't done this work, you know, when we first asked the, the Oblates, the Catholic order of priests that ran St. Michael's, they actually ran 48 residential schools as well across the country about this specific priest. The first response we got back was that, that they were unaware of any allegations against him. And the second response was that they had asked around and nobody else had heard of any allegations against him. And then 
And then once we presented them with one of these um, documents, these court documents that we got access to that showed uh, a student at St. Michael's accused this priest of brutal sexual abuse on a daily basis for years. Um, they reviewed their legal records and found that he had been accused actually 23 times uh, through the IAP process and 16 of those allegations were found to be credible allegations of sexual abuse, not just at St. Michael's, that they were actually um, children from other residential schools that he visited that also say they were sexually abused by him. And, and so, you know, I'm, I, I'm thinking about him and I'm thinking about the survivors who, who he, uh, you know, was found to be credibly accused of abusing and, and, and that that was one priest, that this is one school. And, and I don't know, I feel like we need to better understand the truth before we can have more serious conversations about reconciliation. Uh, and and I, I think it's up to survivors to, to decide what they would like to see from the Catholic Church and from the Pope himself. Yeah. Um, you just found out a few days ago uh, that this is a bit of a hard swerve to it to a different project that you worked on uh, that, that obviously really resonated with a lot of people. And that's Finding Cleo. Uh, I think you just found out a few days ago. Isn't that true that Rolling Stone, yeah. kind of, Rolling Stone, kind of, in, in my mind, the authority on pretty powerful, long form journalism for a lot of years uh, has included your project Finding Cleo in their list of the 25 best true crime podcasts of all time. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Th- considering how popular the true crime genre is in podcasts right now, that's a hell of an achievement. But what did that say to you? I mean, I, it's I, I feel like such an honor, obviously, and I just can't I really can't believe it. You know, I, I feel like at the beginning of my career, um, you, you know, there was zero interest in indigenous stories and indigenous issues. And 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 I feel or there was like, I feel like this misconception that people wouldn't find them interesting, that they weren't important to Canadians, that it was an important history to learn. And, and I feel like that is such validation that that, of course, our stories are important. Of course, it's it's of course, they matter. Of course, uh, stories like my father's, like Cleo Simagonis, like Alberta Williams, like Jermaine Charlo, you know, that, that these are real people at the heart of every podcast that I do and, and that people now understand just how important it is to learn the truth about this shared history. You know, I think that so many Indigenous stories have been misrepresented or underrepresented for so long in Canada and, and it's long overdue that we start telling these stories. And, and I think it should be, you know, Indigenous people who are, who are leading that charge. And, and I'm so grateful to get to, to do this work. As mentioned, uh, Stolen Surviving St. Michael's is a Gimlet Media production, a Spotify original. Um, are you able to tell us about anything that, that you're working on right now or what we can expect next from Connie Walker? Well, I'm, I'm going to go home to Saskatchewan in, uh, in a week and I'm going to have some vacation and downtime with my family, which I'm so excited about. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, like a lot of work to get this podcast out. But as I said, like, you know, I think that everybody on my team, we, we really feel like there's more reporting to do um, on this story. And so we want to we want to keep keep going. You know, we're hoping um, that we can get a, a, at least one bonus episode out. But and then also, I think just, you know, I, I, I want to continue this work. I feel like there there are so many stories and issues that need to be uncovered. And, and I feel really grateful to be supported to do this right now. Well, Connie, it's an absolute honor uh, to have an opportunity to welcome you to the show. I'm such a it feels weird to, in the context of how serious this is to say I'm a fan of your work, but but I am. Um, and let me just say that it's uh, some of the most powerful journalism that I've ever experienced. And it is an experience. I use that word intentionally. Um, this is music to my ears from Tracy, who's watching us live on YouTube right now. She says, I'm going to have to check out this podcast on my vacation in August, which is great. And she, Tracy's not going to have to not going to have to wait every week for a new episode as of June 28th. When, when episode eight came out on Spotify exclusively, people can now listen to all eight in a row. They're about 40 minutes a piece. And uh, really powerful stuff. I think every Canadian uh, needs to hear this podcast. Uh, Connie Walker, the journalist and the host of Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. Thank you so much for your time and your perspective. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. I I really appreciate you listening to the podcast, but also making space for us to have this conversation. That, That means a lot. It's an honor, my friend. Thanks. 
You can follow Connie on uh, Twitter. I encourage you to do so at Connie underscore Walker. Of course, we, uh, from our official account at Real Talk RJ, let you know the handles of all the guests that are going to be joining us on the show. Again, the podcast, you'll find it exclusively on Spotify. That's Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. And make sure you check out Finding Cleo as well. One of the top 25 true crime podcasts of all time says Rolling Stone, which knows a thing or two about telling stories. Mm-hmm. Powerful stuff. Before we get to positive reflections, wanted to let you know that, uh, of course, this show doesn't happen without our sponsors, and that includes the team at Local Environmental. Last year, uh, last week, rather, we were talking to you about their community commitment, and this was so cool. Uh, we told you about Mayor Maya uh, in our hometown of Edmonton. She became the first ever mayor of West Edmonton Mall for a day, which was super cool, through a program called Adaptabilities. Local Environmental is all about investing in the communities where they live and work. This isn't just another company dealing with garbage and recycling. There's so much more than that. Family owned and operating and also giving back. You know, the communities where they live and work. I was hosting the Sturgeon County Mayor's Golf Tournament a few weeks ago. Local Environmentals just made a big acquisition out there. Callahoo Waste is now Local Environmental. Well, there they are on the tee box, introducing themselves to everybody and, of course, letting them know what they're all about. It's it's portable toilets and fencing and vacuum trucks and water hauling and landfill services and short and long-term bins, the roll-off bins, the front-load bins, whether it's a, a purge of your basement, whether it's a home reno project, or whether maybe you're a retailer that's looking for a better relationship with the company you're dealing with for waste, we recommend localenvironmental.ca. Also, a huge shout-out to our friends at Apex Automation. You can check them out online at apexautomation.ca. Are you an engineer that's looking for a job that actually provides you with a sense of satisfaction and personal improvement? Do you enjoy being able to look your clients or partners in the eye and say, look at this, we have made you more efficient and more profitable. And you know, of course, the secret to all of this is a team of great people. You know, you can achieve great things. Reach your full potential by working for Apex Automation. Flexible hours, professional development opportunities, and an amazing corporate culture. You can learn more and get in touch with them about career opportunities today at apexautomation.ca. Hey, Johnny, what do you figure we should talk about today when it comes to the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park? I mean, I'm never going to have a hard time talking about the signature stack burgers, right? You're feeling a little heat? Hey, you want to get your tongue dancing, ladies and gentlemen? We recommend the Flamethrower Signature Stack Burger. That's the third pound double combo, perfectly paired with those Dairy Queen fries. And don't forget the Loaded Steakhouse Signature Stack Burger as well. This is the 100% Canadian beef topped with cheese, bacon, and of course, the famous Dairy Queen onion ring, those fresh Dairy Queen buns, and of course, so why deny yourself the pleasure of a blizzard? Don't do it. The summer menu is still out there, of course, including that cotton candy blizzard. For something a little bit different, you'll find them all at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, West Mountain, and in Sherwood Park at Baseline Road. You make sure you let them know that Real Talk sent ya. I can't believe the show's over already. I feel like you could talk to Connie for about six hours. It just you get so mad listening to some of that stuff. Oh man! And it it's like I it, it didn't affect me or anyone I know. But you just get so, like even hearing about the the paved roads, like it took you that long to upgrade the infrastructure <sighs> at these places, and now the Alberta government, like who in the government was like, yeah, this is a good idea. Like well, it's absolutely maybe the Catholic it's premier. I don't know. Like maybe. what's next? Are they going to upgrade the water so he he can you know Ooh. get his thirst quenched as he goes through? Like w- that's what it takes to to make this stuff happen. I was just like I was just clenching my fist listening to her talk about this stuff. I promised Connie that I want to uh, spoil the podcast the the, the uh, impact of it because if you're going to invest in it, and and I just implore you to do it and listen to it, you learn so much more about her dad. Mm-hmm. And her dad's journey, and it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, I mean, we didn't even get to it, but but Connie's sister. I mean, if you were to Google her dad's name, Howard Cameron, uh, who passed away unfortunately just fifty eight years of age, you will you will not. The top Google results are not about this podcast. Right? The top Google results are some of the advocacy that her dad mm-hmm. did in his later years, uh, as well as mourning the loss of Connie's older sister. Uh, he she was her dad's first daughter 
and she also went into the RCMP, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a story there to be heard. So it's it's a it's a remarkable family story. It's uh, like I said to Connie, I feel like it was an honor to to be to to be privy to her journey, and uh, I'm I'm so grateful that she agreed to join us today. We're gonna end today's show on. A really positive note, a high note, our friends at Kubi Energy, Kubi Renewal, Renewable Energy, every Monday, or at least the first show of every week, uh, give us a chance to sort of explore those silver linings. We call it positive reflections. And today, I wanted to take you on a well, a, a walk that we took yesterday, as a matter of fact. And uh, Johnny, if you want to throw a photo up, I'll describe it for those of you that are listening on the podcast. This is our boxer, Moses, uh, having just an amazing day. There's this beautiful water feature where we love to walk in our home city. This is called the Victoria Promenade. And there's a sculpture with this water feature. The water cascades down, as you can see, and provides a really uh, beautiful opportunity to stop and take pause and listen to the listen to the waterfall and listen to the birds and the trees all around. But but that wasn't it. It wasn't the fact that Moses was able to to cool off in the little reservoir there and and to drink to his heart's content. But while we were there, there was a there was a fella that appeared to be maybe a little bit down on his luck, and he had a reusable grocery bag. And he had his tattered shoes on the ground next to that grocery bag. And he had a toothbrush and toothpaste. And he had some body wash. And he had his dirty t-shirt draped over the railing near the sculpture. And he was in there and he was washing his hair. And he was washing under his arms in this water feature. In this public art installation. And I sat there and I wanted to give him his space and just respect his space. And I uh, imagine that there's some things that go on in your mind as, as you're taking that opportunity to just get clean Mm -hmm. right and this guy as i'm scratching moses behind the ears the guy says hey man can i pet your dog (laughs) so of course you can and him and moses just get it moses i mean he's scratching moses behind the ears and he's scratching him on his butt which moses loves and he's rubbing him on his belly and moses is snuggling into him and this guy's hair is just dripping because he's just been washing himself and and they had a moment as a matter of fact i kind of stepped away for a second and they had a moment for a while And at the end of it, he says, he goes, you can have your dog back, man. And we both kind (laughs) of laughed. And the guy goes to leave on his way and we go to leave on ours. And he turns back to me and he goes, hey, man, thanks. And I said, yeah, man. And I kept walking. And as I was walking away, I just thought that was just a totally normal exercise. That was just kind of something rather unspectacular. I mean, if you're a dog owner, you know, there's a lot of people. Hey, man, can I pet your dog? But I sort of thought about the stigma that a lot of members of our society encounter and how we tend as human beings to look past some people. A lot of people would ignore them. People kind of make us feel uncomfortable sometimes, you know? And I don't have anything profound to offer except to just suggest that that was probably the most meaningful five minutes of the last long time for me. Hmm. And I wanted to encourage all of us this week. To not look past folks, to maybe take a second to invest in an unlikely conversation and tell us about it. We want to hear your stories. How do your, you know, unexpected interactions with your fellow humans impact you through the week? What does it make you think about? Now, we want to chew on these types of things. We want to digest the experiences that real talkers have, and then we want to share those stories every Monday here on Positive Reflections. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can tell us about what's been making an impact in your life. You can get a free solar quote 24-7 at kubienergy.ca. Coming up on uh, this week's editions of Real Talk, wanted to give you a heads up on Wednesday. We're going to be going live to New York City. Psychologist Dr. Fabiana Franco is going to join us to talk about data. It's demographic research into mass shooters. I made an assertion last week. It seems to me they're all young, white males. Some of you chimed in. I said, there's got to be data on this. Dr. Franco will join us on Wednesday. And on Thursday, our conversations with UCP leadership candidates will continue with the polarizing Danielle Smith. If you'd like to submit a question for consideration in that interview, you know where to find us. Make it a great Monday, Real Talkers. Thanks for checking out the show. means a lot when you like it, when you subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast channels, when you rate the show, and of course, when you share our content. We'll talk to you again Tuesday. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook Shivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me. 
Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis Settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com. 